I'm so happy today to have John Walker here. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me. Um, you're the, I believe, the eighth city council candidate I've had. Okay. <laughs> so I think I'm like 10%. That math workout, yeah, yeah, I think that's about right. Although they keep adding more, so yeah, <laughs> my percentage is dropping. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for coming. You're the, you're in my district. You're the third district three council I've had, uh, candidate I've had. So thank you for taking the time. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, like, how it is right now in the campaign. Like, what? what yeah, is it, what is it like? You know, I think it's it's pretty early in the campaign. I think not a lot of people are paying that much attention to it. So a lot of my time has been spent with organizations, like possible endorsement interviews, uh, meeting up with sort of activists and nonprofits and those things. So <clears throat> I've tried to do a little bit of retail campaigning, you know, talking to people on the street, getting them to sign a petition and stuff. But uh, yeah, I would say at this point, it's still fairly insidery baseball, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, it... people, the people who really care about the city politics stuff is, you know, they're passionate, but they're not like a massive number compared yeah. to, you know, all yeah. the voters. You're yeah, you're talking to the right person because, yeah, yeah, it's like it's I was just going to ask you, like, is that and maybe that'll change, I guess, with this new format that in the city. But like, are you is that frustrate you? Because sometimes it's frustrating for me just to get people interested in the election and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's tough. I mean. One, I would say a longstanding problem, which I am glad that the charter reform changed, is no clear lines of responsibility in like our local government. Both, you know, because we have three layers, we got metro, we got county, we got city, but also the bureau system, which is, I mean, the commission system, which was absolutely right. terrible because it's like, well, who... You voted for this, but this other city council member is the one actually implementing it. Like, who's really responsible for all these things? Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I create. I think that created a lot of frustration, a lot of like inability to get a grasp of like what was happening. Um, and you know, the I think we're seeing that. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of sort of renewed interest because things have changed, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people sort of really interested in that. But it is funny. I'll go to these events for like. Um, Com or like organizations that are building uh, low cost or managing low cost housing, and it'll be like forty people in the industry and about forty candidates. Right, <laughs> so yeah. anytime you go to events, it's almost half and half. It's like kind of people out, who outweighed number, of yeah, candidates. are paired there, yeah. and people who are candidates there. Yeah. So, well, but it is what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, uh, I was just gonna get into. I, actually, I was going to plug really quick, too. Like, if you're a candidate and want to come on, just reach out to me. Sometimes I'll reach out to people. Sometimes people reach out to me. It doesn't matter. I'll try to get you on the show. Sure. Um, um, yeah, and I was I was curious. I kind of asked you a second ago, but, like, I ask all candidates, like, are you forming alliances? Do you hang out with candidates in your district? Like, how does that work with... Uh... I have not formed any alliances with any other candidates. Um, you know, it's this is really the first time this type of voting has really been tested out. I understand it exists in Ireland, but they already have like multi-party systems. Mm -hmm. So you're really voting your party, not the individual in a lot of those places. So, you know, I don't know what strategy is going to work best. I, I don't think anybody really does. I am really focused on my message, which mm -hmm. is implementation, implementation, implementation. And I think I have the ability to be a strong second or third or fourth choice for a lot of people because kind of regardless of what you care about, we have a lot of things that we have passed and they're just not working because we don't have people who are experts on, you know, setting criteria, following the metrics, doing follow through, doing like that, you know, process analysis, that procedural analysis uh, that I have a history of doing. Um, so, you know, I think that's the lane i'm trying to be in right now yeah and we'll see if it works yeah that kind of makes sense um because i was thinking a second ago i was literally just thinking this yesterday driving home when you were mentioned the bureaus of like like i'm not a big fan of a lot of the new format of this incoming format but the one thing i do like is that the bureaus are no longer assigned yes. to to commissioners and in this random fashion that's just kind of hey, yeah hey are you an expert in emergencies or, or parks or whatever it is and and, yeah. And people just are just stuck with that. Yeah, I, I actually so. got my master's in public policy at PSU. And mm -hmm. it was interesting and frustrating because we we were the last major city to have the commission system. So we mm -hmm. like we had to talk about it and study it, you know, as you know, because that's where we are. But I mean, it just isn't 
there's a reason all the other cities got yeah. rid of it a long time ago because yeah. it's incoherent because yeah. you know you'd have three members on the council want to do something but maybe the thing they want to do is in the bureau of the person who doesn't want to do it and so they instead put that thing in their bureau and you know was it i think it was like last week they finally took the five different places you had to contact about permits and put them in one yeah. office and like that happened just like across the board with all sorts of issues and then yeah you'd have no idea who to blame or like somebody would be running because their opponent was like the fire commissioner and you're like they've done a terrible job i know fires or whatever they get elected and the mayor would be like i'm not gonna give you the fire commission right. give you the parks commission and then <laughs> I mean, yeah. just incoherent. It doesn't make any sense. So. Yeah. And it's literally, I believe, or was from the 1800s. Like, that's yeah. how long we were using that. But um, yeah, I was curious about your background. I'm, I'm always just happy to talk to people who worked in journalism because <laughs> they'll share or something. But um, yeah, I'm curious about your, your background as a journalist and what you were doing. Yeah. So I just started writing during this, the 2008 election, just policy writing, just like for my own interest. Um, and that was getting picked up, um, you know, by places like Huffington Post and like Washington Post and stuff. And so I was recruited by FDL, Fire Dog Lake. Uh, this is like a small progressive news advocacy organization. Um, and I worked there for several years, writing about policy, really covering healthcare in depth, um, student loan reform, uh, marijuana legalization. Um, we succumbed to the same kind of dynamics of a lot of media at the time, like basically Facebook and all of them changed their algorithms and, mm -hmm. you know, the pivot to video, it, it kind of destroyed it. And right, right. then after that, I, I did a lot of freelance work. So for Vice, uh, The Intercept, uh, The Week, American Prospect. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my I love to just do policy writing. Um, yeah, it's not the most profitable. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's not. It's not the easiest. But uh, I wrote. I wrote a piece for Eater about why Portland has such a good food scene and okay. why it's all policy driven. Because yeah, yeah. It, it, we are the cheapest place to basically start a restaurant idea, hmm. particularly with a food pod, a food cart like mm -hmm. that you can put in a food pod. And so you know, we got a lot of. I mean, a lot of our best restaurants and stuff started as food carts. You know, with like a twenty thousand dollar investment where. Almost anywhere else in the country, you know, it could be a hundred thousand, could be like a million, you know. Our like our beer license here is like a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And I know in Jersey where I grew up, because they like they fixed the number. Mm. So you basically have to buy a liquor license off someone else who has it. It's like half a million or something. Wow. You know, so like, you know, it's all those little policy decisions we made. Um, they can have a really nice impact and you see it like 10, 15, 20 years later because I mean, all some of all my favorite restaurants, to a large degree, like started as food part, mm -hmm. food carts, you know, a decade ago. Yeah, no, it is an interesting like path to start a small business that way. Um, and I never thought about it that way because you know, I think a lot of people would just start with the brick and mortar. <laughs> yeah, but you don't have to. Um, and this is kind of an aside question, but I, I remember hearing some stuff over the past few years about how. <laughs> And feel free to like I don't know if this is not in your wheelhouse, but yeah. but how food carts, they are really cheap to operate, but there's all these like sanitation issues and yeah, my and, under my understanding when I was doing that article, which I mean I'm not an expert on this, yeah. was they they've changed the rules for new food pods need to have like a like a proper hookup, I guess. Okay. Um, it used to be that they could collect like the wastewater and like the gray water could be collected by like a third party like, with like a pumping system yeah and i think now if you have a food pod of a certain size like you got to have that built in okay and so, so i mean they are changing some of the they are changing i mean that's added costs like it used to be you could just have literally an empty parking lot and now i think you know you need like the proper electric and water hookup mm -hmm. and stuff you know so it's added some cost to it i mean there's the trade-off you know it's yeah. public safety it's yeah. i just wanted to bring up yeah the regulation side because i remember hearing that year a couple years ago of like it might not be the most regulated thing and maybe it needs more but i don't know yeah um, i mean yeah that's that's all I've policy never, making i've never had a issue at a food cart so i can't say that you know no i, I i've <laughs> never had either but yeah you know yeah i was just curious um yeah and so you no longer do that but that was like many years you were doing yeah i did that for, and... i did that for many years um we me and my wife moved out here about a decade ago um she got a different job 
Um, and I decided I really liked doing the policy work. Um, the sort of journalism part was less of it. You know, I just loved investigating the cause of something and figuring out what might be the solution or whatever. And so I was like, oh, I really want to work in policy, work in government. Um, so I got my master's at PSU. Nice. Okay. Um, and you sort of transitioned from that to what you do now and yes. as a regulator, is that what you would call Yeah, I am. So I am the policy analyst at the Office of Financial, the Office of Actuarial and Financial Analytics okay. at the Oregon Health Authority. So I am basically part of the regulator team that regulates the Medicaid program. So okay. it's about $10 billion a year in spending, and I regulate the financial end. So I make sure the the companies that are providing the Medicaid are financially solvent, mm. um, are meeting their financial regulations. You know, we don't have a risk of bankruptcy. We make sure that they are spending a set share of the amount we give them on healthcare. Um, not on administrative overhead. So that's the type of work I currently do. That's cool. Yeah. And, and like you said, because you're into policy, that's more your lane anyway. Like, oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, it's it's very interesting, too, because it really shows that in policy, I mean, there's a great saying in policy. I didn't come up with this, that don't tell me your values. Show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. Mm. And so much is driven by buy the money like the stuff i'm working on right now i work with the rates team we figure out how much money overall the ccos will get and if there's sort of money left over or you know there's some room or whatever what could we use that on like what tools and how do we get like the matching front from cms so you know we're working on stuff around dental to make sure that there's enough providers and enough people in medicaid are getting dental and so you know when you focus on the money aspect you really see how much policy is driven by the money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and obviously, like I can see that transition from you know doing kind of policy and stuff to wanting to get into city government now. Because, um, like you said, you bring that experience, which seems helpful. I was curious, like, do you? I haven't really talked to anyone on here who has talked about OHA, but like, do you just receive criticism all the time about the organization or about the the? Uh, you know, I I like I. When I talk to people, I've received some criticism. I mean, it's the piece I work on yeah, rarely gets yeah. criticized. Right, right, right. Very few people actually really understand it or know it. That's so what like, I was going to say. You're, you're kind of doing <laughs> Medic what is it, Medicare, Medicaid? Or Medicaid. Medicaid. Yeah, so it's, run by the state. it's not, I'm sure it would have, a lot of people would criticize it. It has nothing to do with what you're working on. But yeah, but yeah, no, like it is, it is a big organization. Mm -hmm. It is massive. I mean, it does a lot of things. Um, you know, I don't have a hand in a lot of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I hear them out, but, you know, I kind of let them know what my role is. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it has really become a lot more important. Um, we have, we are now covering about a third of people in Oregon, either on Medicaid or the new expanded uh, bridge program. Okay. So ev everyone up to like 200% of the federal poverty line um, can be, can access Medicaid or the Medi Medicaid-like program, run, you know, free healthcare from the state. Um, and, that, you know, that's a big change from just like a decade ago mm -hmm. when the Medicaid program was, you know, like 8 or 9%, you know, with everything. Um, so, you know, it's a really big deal. Um, and it has a big impact on a lot of people's lives. Yeah. I was just curious. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, yeah, so I want to get into, like I said, I can see how that transitions to being a good candidate for city government and how you could apply all that stuff. Um in a meaningful way. Uh, but I want to start with this. <laughs> like, I just think a lot of your branding and your kind of campaign stuff is funny and interesting. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, uh, like you have the boring thing yeah. and then you, and then what I had here was the second choice. You could, you said you're a good second choice. Cause obviously now we have this ranked ballot and you can, I, you can put as many as you want really, I think, but, um, yeah, it's, I think it's up to six, six. Yeah. You can rank up to six, which, I mean, there's going to be 18 or 20 or even more in some districts. So, but yeah. yeah, you know, I, I am running as the boring, the most boring man in Portland <laughs> and I want to make city government as boring as I am mm -hmm. because when things work well, you, you're not paying attention to them. Right, right. You know, it's, it's like sort of the classic journalism thing. Like if it bleeds, it leads. Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you rarely are writing stories about like, you know, uh, parks uh, department comes in exactly on budget. Right. Like a well-running refrigerator or something yeah like yeah it's like um, hey everything's running fine 
<laughs> and like that's that's what I want to bring is that I like I'm running on implementation, implementation, implementation. I feel like if you look at it, you know, and I really studied this before I like got in the race. But if you look at how people are voting for candidates mm -hmm. versus how they're voting for like ballot measures and stuff, you know, people in Portland are very generous. They want to help the other people in Portland. They're willing to even pay taxes to do that. Um, they want sort of a high tax, high service environment, but we're getting a high tax, low service environment. Right. That is not politically sustainable. And I think we're already starting to see the backlash. Um, I think we could see it grow even more because, again, that's just not sustainable. And eventually people transition to if they're not getting the services, they don't want to pay the taxes on it, which is a completely reasonable thing. Um, and I just look at all these programs we have. And they're not working. And it doesn't matter what your platform is. It doesn't matter what your ideas are. If you can't make them implemented, they, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is what I would focus on relentlessly is why, you know, every idea that gets brought before the city council is like, okay, how do we know it's working? What's the metrics we're going to measure it by? When are we going to evaluate it again? At that point, are we going to cut it? Are we going to expand it? Are we going to, you know, change it? Like, what is our timeline of implementation? What is our timeline for, like, you know, reform, for cutting, for changing? All those things. That has to be laid out before I'll support anything. And I'm happy to work with anybody or anybody on the council to be like, if you got a plan, even if I say I'm not going to vote for it, I'm going to sit down with you to be like, but how would you make it work? Because, I, you know, I don't want anything we're doing to fail, even if I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's the experience I bring, you know, being able to like, again, I got my master's in public policy. I've worked on policy for a long time, both reporting on it from the outside, working on it from the inside, you know, so kind of regardless of what you feel, regardless of what your issues are, if you want some people on the council who actually know how to turn an idea into a reality, you know, I'd be a great second, third, fourth choice if I'm not your first choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just. I don't know. It's it's funny to me to like see this stuff, these like campaign tactics kind of play out because like you know, everyone, every candidate I talk to, this is just untreaded territory. So it's yes. just interesting all the tactics and stuff. Um, that is a good point though. I was I was curious like as you were saying that, I even feel like this, and I'm almost forty. I'm not that old, but <laughs> like, I'm, do you, I'm forty as well. Yeah. Do you feel like? I just feel like the the demographics of a lot of the candidates are skews kind of younger. Um, at least I don't know maybe. Yeah, there's... but does it feel like you have a wealth more experience than some of the other candidates? Um, you know, I so I you end up meeting a lot of the candidates, and for the most part, they seem like great people. A lot of them seem like quite earnest, you know, in what they believe. And like, you know, I, I think that's like the great thing about it is I feel like a lot of people have gotten in, and a lot of people have gotten in for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't feel like a lot of them have a lot of experience in policy making and policy setting and policy implementation. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why I got in because I was looking around at the people and I was like, okay, you know, great ideas, you know, nice ideas, nice ideas. The city is overflowing with nice ideas. Right. Um, the problem is not getting new ideas. Right. The That'll problem, only take you so far. I mean, a lot of the work the city council is going to be doing is Again, it's going to be very boring work because we have this messed up, tangled disaster of everybody who was on the city council before. They would have their bureau. Anything they'd want to do, they cared about, even though it made more sense to be in the parks. They're like, well, I'll get this in my transportation bureau. That way I can oversee it. And then so everything we do has been cut up and sliced up. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes sense about how it's organized. And like just threading that all together in a normal functioning way and being like, you know, who are duplicating tasks? Who's going to be the new bot? You know, who's going to report to who now as mm -hmm. opposed to like, that's all boring. I mean, that's not the glamorous work, but like that is, I think, 80, 90 percent of what the city council is going to need to do over the next four years mm -hmm. is we have 100 years of bad political incentives that created a weird system. Yeah, you're not going to overdo it that overnight and you're not going to achieve any of the ideas you want until you tackle that. Yeah, no, I, I really like I don't know, you even bringing that up and running on that because it's like, I, I talk a lot about how, yeah, like these, 
the backlog of maintenance and deferred stuff is like not sexy, but it has to be done. And like, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It seems like that's kind of what you're talking about. Um, some of it anyway. Uh, yeah. And I mean, again, that was a problem we had with the commission system because you had someone who was Rhodes. Mm -hmm. And so instead of the whole city council being like, oh, this is a problem. We should address it. it the whole city council was like, well, if we give money to the Rhodes guy. Yeah, it gets all focalized to one. <laughs> that's person. not money for ours. Right. And like, I want to have fun with the money and I want to run my bureau. And I mean, that's a terrible incentive, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm glad that that will be over with. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, we need people on the council to sort of understand that dynamic that we're going to have to undo so much damage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just, I don't know. I feel like I read and hear about it more and more. And it's, yeah, it's not even just PBA. It's just all the different bureaus. Like they kind of have the same issue of like go, going to new ideas before addressing all the kind of buildup of old problems yeah. and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's cool. Cool to hear. Um, I'm going to get, get into some of these uh, just generic issues here or sure. the ones we always, almost always talk about. Um, so what's your kind of approach to homelessness in Portland? So I think there there's many aspects to it because, you know, there's not like a single homeless people. You know, there is a right. there's all sorts of people who ended up in that situation for all sorts of different reasons. I think one, we have to build a lot more housing, um, you know, both because people need housing and the cheaper we make rent and everything, the more the further our money goes, you know, mm -hmm. if you got a million dollars to spend on helping house people, you know, and rent is a lot cheaper. You're helping twice as many people, you know, with rent assistance or anything. So that's, that's a big thing. We got to also build more shelters, more transitional, more, you know, pods or whatever. Um, we have to build enough supply and other cities have done this. Like New York city has long had enough to, a lot of the cities on the West coast have long had enough shelter beds mm -hmm. for the population. Once we do that, we have to say that there's no more camping. It is, it is highly dangerous. I think just yesterday there was two major fires. Mm -hmm. I mean, one right at a bridge, which could have easily caused significant damage, you know, and blocked access to our major medical center. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the rate of people dying in these, you know, camps with fires and stuff, you know, is extraordinarily high. Um, and we just can't, you know, once you build the facilities to help people you need to then make people take the help right i i think we you know there's some candidates who are out there and they disagree with this but i don't think we have the political will or will continue to have the political will to fund all the activities we need to help people if we're also saying but we won't get rid of like camping on the street like you know yeah i like i just don't think there is a political will for that like you have to see something in response to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think we build it and then you really effectively force people to take part in the services and take part in treatment. I think we have gone way too far in the wrong direction in an idea of freedom, which I think is misguided in the fact that, you know, I've had people in my family who have suffered from mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. The idea that a person, you know, whether it's addiction or usually often the people who are suffering from addiction, it's a co-occurring disorder. Mm -hmm. Like the the drugs they're taking are to treat, not to treat, but, you know, to help them with a really serious mental, mental condition they're suffering from otherwise. There is no, there's no sympathy. There's no empathy in allowing someone who is clearly can't make decisions for themselves to say, right. oh, they should be making decisions for themselves. Like, this person who is like, you know, clearly out of their mind. Well, you know, they, they don't think this is the right thing for them. You know, they're making conscious, good, yeah. logical decisions. No, that's. that's yeah. Or that they'll ever come to that. No. Yeah. Conclusion um, on their own. Yeah. Because um, um, I don't know. I'm sure you're aware too. like a lot of um, like I had an uncle who was schizophrenic for most of his life. He's not alive anymore. But as far as I know, a lot of these, you know, like there's meth induced psychosis that yeah. actually increases uh, kind of disorders like that and kind of gets into this feedback loop that just keeps going. But um, I mean, that sounds like a good balanced approach. I was curious, what have you heard about like Keith Wilson isn't the only one who has this, but his kind of rapid shelter. Yes. I've, I've actually, thing. you know, again, one thing about being at all these things is I've uh, been at events with Keith several times. I've heard him talk about it. You know, I think, 
I think it's a good approach mm -hmm. in general. Like we could build a lot more shelters. You know, the holdup is merely political will. Mm. I mean, like the city has space, you know, building temporary shelters is not overly expensive. You know, money will have to be provided and everything, but like, you know, we know how to do it. Like mm -hmm. yeah. building a building a house is not like some lost technology to time. Like yeah. building like a, you know, apartment buildings or even the pods or anything like mm -hmm. it's we're fully capable of doing it. We just have to choose to do it. Yeah. And like you mentioned, people, we talk about this a lot, but, you know, New York City, they kind of dealt with it. People point to Houston a lot. I know their land of land use is way different, but I think New York City is always a good example because in my head, I always figured they did it because it's so cold there in the winter that people would be dying all the time if, you know, oh, yeah, if they no. didn't have shelter. So, yeah, I um, mean, and we... We're not letting people die of exposure. We're letting them die of unsanitary conditions and dangerous and conditions. Who but knows like, what else? Yeah. Yeah. We're, I mean, there's no, I mean, the rate of death amongst unhoused people is so high that the idea that we are helping them or it's being, I mean, you know, it's being compassionate to allow right. this existence to continue is, I think, just highly misguided. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for me to like, Anyone that this yeah like sees that as compassionate because it's not compassionate to people who live around it like in actual homes and it's not compassionate to people living in tents and all that stuff like it's just like a lose lose yeah. <laughs> situation so um um yeah I was curious too like this is kind of a good segue into um because I was gonna bring up this whole deflection stuff that people have been talking about um. Basically, I guess the way Multnomah County handles it is kind of a unique outlier. And yeah, I mean, we are the biggest county in the state, but but yeah, so like there was some meetings this week with um, the county and about these deflection centers with the September 1st deadline. And I mm -hmm. guess a lot of the residents didn't get their questions answered, but I was just curious, like your take on that and um, how you would, I guess what you would do, this would be after September, obviously, but working with the county to kind of get them going <laughs> yeah so working with the county is gonna be difficult that has remained a long standing problem and i think it is endemic of all the issues that we've been having in local government here because there's acknowledgement we need to do something and we're doing something and nobody can tell us what it is that it is supposed to achieve because you know that like that is what we need because you can't even tell if it's a good idea or a bad idea mm -hmm. until you know what it's supposed to be doing. Like, what is the purpose of this thing? Is it to be a place for people who are, you know, just like a classic drunk tank almost? Like they're mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. they're too inebriated that they would fall into traffic and get run over. So like, just physically prevent them from yeah. And I've heard, hurt. I've heard a lot of people who asked for that say like, you know, we used to have um cheers for drunk like yeah. people who were drinking too much, but they wanted an equivalent of that for these newer drugs. Right? Yeah. And like so, so like is that its goal? Because like Right. I mean, we can debate whether or not that that is what we need or what we should be doing, right. but like you is, have to is, is that the point? Yeah. You have to get to first principle because yeah. we can't even judge if it's effective mm -hmm. until you say what it is. And I think I mean, it's ridiculous the county can't express what is the purpose of it mm -hmm. and say, no, the purpose of this is to bring people to do X, whether uh, it's to bring them there to off is it to bring them there to offer them treatment and let them walk away. OK, I mean, I, I might not agree with that approach, but at least then I could know how to judge it. It's like, spelled out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> how many people are coming? How many people are then taking that information and making use of it? You yeah. know? Is it 1%? Oh, yeah, well, then it's probably not a good program. Is it 40%? Oh, well, you know what? Then that's maybe working really well. Like, so you have to have that first principle conversation. We've not been having it a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, but we start doing something without deciding what it is we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then you can't judge what we're doing. And all right, so that goes to that. I mean, long term, if we can fix the city, and its structure and everything, I would love to do a merged city county. I think mm. we are one of the largest cities that is not a merged city county, or at least has a county that has a lot of power. You know, there's other places like, you know, the, the counties are meaningless. They don't do anything. I think it's it's a terrible incentive to have one, Multnomah County is mostly Portland, mm -hmm. you know, for the, you mm -hmm. know, it's not exactly, but, but nobody knows who's responsible for anything. Um, 
I don't think that's good for democracy. I don't think that's yeah, good for yeah. basic accountability and running things. It's a good point, yeah. Because um, I still, it just drives me crazy. People just blame Ted Wheeler for everything, and and I'm not like, I'm just neutral on him. But it's just like people don't understand, yeah, county issues versus city and all that stuff. And yeah, uh, I mean, long term that is what I like to do. I mean, short term, I think we have to be willing to walk away from the county. You know, we've we've we have this joint homeless thing. It's been very poorly managed. More importantly, it's not been clear again what the metrics are. What are we doing? Um, they yeah, obviously they have most of the money. I think unless you get the proper oversight, like I again, I want to be like, what are these goals? What's happening? Who will no longer be running it if six months from now they're not being met or whatever, you know? Um, and if yeah, at some point you have to be willing to walk away. And I, I don't think the city has expressed the willingness to walk away. And so mm -hmm. I think we've just been muddling through as we've been doing with everything. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting idea than the other, like, is there a equivalent city in your mind that's done that? Um, so a lot I of these, I don't know much about it. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, San Francisco is a merged city council county. Um, I lived in Virginia for a while. All the cities there are their own county. Okay. So basically once you got big enough, you became your own city. Just a, yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of cities around the country. I think New York ironically still has counties that are smaller than the city of New York. Okay. Um, but like they don't have any power. And then like Massachusetts, they still have a county, but like they're meaningless. Like the, like the only thing the county does is it like registers your deeds or something like it, mm -hmm. it doesn't get any money. It doesn't spend on anything. Like it's the city that, you know, so, you know, it's a, it's a common thing. Pretty common. Yeah. Um, I was curious to see when you were talking a second ago, like as a policy guy, like, does it seem like what the count, what Monoma County is doing to comply with HB 4002 is basically just that, like they're trying to just comply with the law and there's no out it, outcome in mind or whatever. It, it almost feels to a degree like malicious compliance almost okay. where you, I mean, they cannot, art if you cannot articulate why you're doing something i mean that that's infuriating <laughs> okay um yeah <laughs> oh. yeah i like i i i cannot imagine because it's not it's not cheap what they're building there like you know you have to get resources you got to have managers and everything i can't imagine either as an employer or even just as a human being to tell someone you've got this job and then the person is like okay what am i trying to do yeah and they're like like it is that, like, it is hard to picture that reality of like what's going on there yeah like i don't like either they're not sharing with the public what they want it to be doing which i mean is its own source of issues or they are again doing it to comply but refusing to effectively comply in which again is its other set of issues but yeah you, you should never not be able to articulate what a program is doing yeah um yeah. or it's the intent of it all right. I like it. Um, um, okay. Let me get into policing and PSR. Like what's your view of both of those and how they work together, the balance between them and all that stuff. I think hopefully again, moving away from the commission system, we can move away from the balkanization of these things and get more cooperation. I think like everything else, you know, I I've told other people this, um, the state has a monopoly on violence and monopoly is always le always are inclined to corruption, but it's way better than a free market of violence, you know? Okay. You know, sometimes you just have no choice but to create a structure and you have to treat the police, I think, like you treat almost any monopoly, you know, whether it's the natural monopoly of like an electric company or a water company, you know, they're essential, they're important, and they also have to be closely watched and monitored so they don't abuse uh, the power they've been given, which is substantial. And I think we should focus you know, a lot of our efforts on further professionalization of the police. I mean, they're an essential service. I would love to see long term when I see what are the issues that we're having a tough time recruiting officers. I mean, I don't know why we only have one police academy and it's in Salem for the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it would make sense for the Portland area to maybe have its own, yeah. you know, focus on urban issues, training around the environment they'll be facing. Um, I think we need the police to be really focused on the high danger 
activities that are also easily discourageable, like the street takeovers and street racings. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, yeah. A, that's a classic example of there's a lot of crimes people are committing because they have no other choice. There's a lot of crimes people are committing because they have a compulsion and it's just tough to get them to stop right. their addiction. That one's not one of them, though. But yeah, street takeovers <laughs> are one that are insanely dangerous. Yeah. And if you make the cost, you know, if you make the possibility of arrested or having your car impounded or all that higher, mm -hmm. then it stops. You know, like that is a classic example of where enforcement is effective and we should really be focused, the police, on those types of things. Um, yeah, I think... When it goes to the street response, mm -hmm. um, I would love to, again, have more metrics of what is happening there. I don't. It's frustrating because they seem to be doing good work. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have a good answer for what it is that is working and what is not working. Mm -hmm. And I think a focus on a non-police response to a lot of issues is very smart. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's good because it frees up police resources for where they're needed. Um, and I think it's good because a lot of people don't respond positively to someone who is prepared to use violence, and they should be if it is a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. But having someone who is not showing up with the ability to escalate things, I think is smart. But again, we have to know how the program is working and how to properly steer it. And just like everything else, like, we're not getting good information. Is, uh, do you think part of that's because it's such a young agency or whatever you call it yeah. i think part of it's such a young agency i think part of it is again a lot of what was happening with it is bureaucratic infighting mm -hmm. between the different council members that had it and started it yeah um and it's been kind of not placed in the structure where it should be um again for bureaucratic infighting reasons and then i think when you're doing that you're not you don't want to admit failure or they admit the need for change because that's your program. Yeah. Um, and that's their program. And you don't want the money from your program to their program. Yeah. Hopefully when it's the city council, it's all of our programs. Yeah. Is this helping the city? Not is this helping my little fiefdom? Right. It is, yeah, definitely a, a bureau problem. That, one of the top problems with how they're managed right now. Yeah, so I think anytime you have that kind of conflict, nobody wanted to... You don't get to take be the flag honest. Or, yeah. Yeah. Be honest about what was happening because, you know, that could be used against you in that weird infighting. And yeah. So. so even if it's, doesn't matter what the bureau is, if it's, you know, horrible, everyone's saying, well, everything's going great. Yeah. Because <laughs> they don't want to take the, the hit for it. Um, yeah. No, I, I like, I like uh, that kind of balance. I like the idea too of having an academy here. I don't know how like feasible that is, but that would be, yeah. For uh, recruiting, that would be really interesting. Yeah. I think, again, I will not move forward with any policy until you do a proper analysis of yeah. it. You know, it does it cost <laughs> effective, will achieve the goals, all those things. I do think that I hear that a big problem is we are have a lot of empty slots that are not being filled. The problem is recruiting. Um, and that creates all sorts of bad dynamics of people overworked and overworked yeah. people for anything over time and result yeah. in mistakes, result in not doing a job as well. And you know. You really don't want that when lives are on the line or could be on the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think you then go to a root cause. And like, I used to do this in journalism all the time. Hear people complain about something. It's like, okay, you know, interview a bunch of people, interview that next stage. Like, you know, who's the managers? Who's the bottleneck? Who are they claiming the problem is? And, you know, see what they say. And then, like, you know, you follow that chain of thread to where it leads. Um, and I think, you know, if that's where it leads. That's what we should pursue. And if, you know, as a city councilor, and I've got full time to look into issues in depth, it doesn't lead that way, then, you know, I'll try something else. But yeah. Yeah, there was two things I was thinking. Um, one was like, just so for viewer, if they don't know, I, like, in in the new form, these would all be under the bear, just in case people don't yes. know. <laughs> so Portland Street Response, Portland Police Bureau, all that stuff. Yeah. Would no longer be under a commissioner, it'd be under the mayor. Yeah, it'd be run or by the, the city manager. The manager, really. yeah. I guess then, then the mayor, yeah. yeah. Um, um, and that's probably going to be the most important job of the city is the, the city council is writing basically the city manager contract. Okay. Yeah. Like, who are we going to recruit? How are we going to recruit them? What are we going to put on them? You know, what kind of severance are we going to offer so that they have the freedom to make changes? You know, how much freedom? So like that, I think might be the most important thing the city council does. And yeah. Yeah. 
you know, I I work on this the Medicaid contract all the time. I mean, it's a big, complicated document. You know, I don't know how many other members on the possible you know candidates really have an in depth knowledge of working on a complex yeah contract like that. So yeah, it's a good point. The other thing I was thinking was, um, I'm glad you brought up the street racing stuff because I've I don't think I've talked about it on here, but it is just a huge. It's a complex thing because, like, I understand how culturally a lot of people are into it. But, like, just this week, I, I was going to bring it up that uh, one a woman that was killed at the bus stop. Yes. And I said she's suing Peabot and the police bureau and, like, the city and just a bunch of different – for basically negligence or something yeah. like that. Um, but, yeah, it's just an interesting – I'm actually surprised I haven't seen a lot of them this summer yet. But um, – that I know the city has stepped up enforcement it does, around yeah. it. And, but, like, that's the thing is, like, it is – it is an issue that is literally just a question of enforcement because mm -hmm. no one. It's like no the, one. If yeah. The penalty's high enough. Yes. Nobody's going to be doing that. Yeah. Nobody's addicted to street takeovers. Nobody is requiring street takeovers to pay their bills or whatever. Yeah. Like in his desperate form, like it is purely a question of if you enforce it and you take away people's cars and everything that they'll stop, you know. So just whatever it takes to get to that point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah. I was going to ask you quickly about the Grant high school phone pilot. I think it's a pilot they're calling it. Um, how do you feel about that? And just phone bans for students? I think, again, this is a thing where, you know, I study literature on everything. You know, I love reading policy papers. That's why I'm boring. Um, but like the research has been pretty clear. Phones in schools are bad. Yeah. They're bad for students. They're bad for teachers. They're bad for just the learning environment. I want to say they're just bad for people in general, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is a fair amount of research showing that they're bad for people in general, but, you know, this is about schools. Specifically students, yeah. Yeah, ban them. I mean, I went to school before there was smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a smartphone to be part of a school. I mean, the research is pretty clear, and I think... It is both that combination of the common sense would say this machine that's literally designed to distract you and provide you with all sorts of distractions and things that would take your attention away. Like, you know, literally billion dollar, trillion yeah, that, dollar that's companies. That's what the algorithm does, yeah. Are about making this thing very interesting to look at. Um, yeah, that's probably not going to be good for your students to have when they're trying to learn. And then you look at the research and it's like, oh, yes, this common sense thing has been based to be you know, bad for students. And so I don't, I don't understand why it has not been implemented. Yeah. Well, especially for, cause I always just think of mental health and I know for young girls and young boys, I'm guessing it's, it's just horrible. Like yeah. <laughs> you compare yourself to everyone else and it doesn't help you and you're distracted. And I don't know. I could go on and about. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yes, it's, it's one of these classic examples where we don't do things in Portland. We allow it to go to like a committee and then mm. a follow-up committee and a commission and stuff. It's like, no, sometimes the people in power need to act on what is available information. And you know what? If it turns out to be a bad idea, you can always reverse policies, but inaction should not be an excuse. I mean, yeah. you shouldn't be allowed to just pretend that you're making you're not making a choice because inaction is always a choice. Mm. Like that's always and this is a classic example. That, Ban this. We should be banning them across all the schools. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very clear it will be a positive. And if it isn't, in a year or two, you, I mean, you can reverse it. Go I back, can't yeah. imagine why you would want to. You, th um, you think, yeah, in 10, 20, 30 years, we'd just be like that. We were crazy to even oh, yeah. allow this for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like. Yeah, I like I just can't imagine why anyone thinks that it is a positive in schools to have a thing that's literally designed to be really I I look at my phone all the time. Everybody does. Like yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. It there's a lot of interesting stuff on there. There's yeah. news. There's it's hard to look away. Yeah. You know, there's social media. It's like, yeah. When I'm trying to pay attention to a subject that might be not that interesting to me, having access to something that is way more interesting to me, yeah, that that's not going to be positive yeah. for learning. Well the one thing I the one thing I've heard from parents a lot and i've got do you have kids i, don't know if you I do have kids um i've heard from parents that like well i just want to be in touch with my kids and i don't know what to tell people about that but i mean 
first of all, you should not be getting in touch with your kids in the middle of class. Like <laughs> yeah. that is again, that is a source of distraction. I mean, I, I, we went to school mm -hmm. before there were smartphones. Yeah. I, you know, it was fine. Yeah. We made it work. Yeah. I mean, if you desperately need to get in, I mean, we had a system. If you need to get in touch with your kids, you call the office. Mm -hmm. They could beep through to the room, get a message to them. Yeah. There's plenty of landline phones. There's plenty of landline phones. There's plenty. I mean, there is office administrators mm -hmm. who are there to take that. Like, yeah. Any emergency, emergency time. Call, yeah. yeah th this was all figured out a long time ago. Like, this yeah. is not like, re <laughs> this is not, you know, a difficult question that hasn't been figured out previously. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't. Yeah, no, I'm just curious. I'm curious to see how it'll play out too. Like if they go through the pilot and then they reverse or they implement it more, or I don't know. It's curious. It's interesting to me, but um, I had a few questions about, um, are you happy with the charter? Just how it played, how it played out, what we're getting into now with this ranked choice voting. Are you happy with single transferable vote, all that stuff? So, I mean, I am very happy the commission system's gone. That was terrible. Yeah. That needed to be done. I am too. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it is unfortunate. That one thing I'd actually change, one of the first things I'd change if I was elected to city council is uh, we had several people on the Citizens Charter Reform Commission who are now running. Yeah. And elsewhere, pretty much everywhere else, that's illegal. I've you heard. can't be on a citizen. Like in California, you can't be on the citizen redistricting committee mm -hmm. and then run in those districts. Yeah. Um, you can't be on the citizen. Usually that is a requirement for it to be a citizen committee is you can't then have it advance your political goals. So I do think yeah. that a lot of the decisions made were in partially bad faith as a result of that, of people actually looking at how will this advance my political career, right. not how will this best serve everyone in the city. And I think I don't think it was fair to tie them all together. I think we could have gotten rid of the commission system without single transfer voting even without districts i think i think it should have been up to the people of portland to decide mm. i mean they if you looked at the polling if you looked at everything they wanted to get rid of the commission system commission system was bad you know did they want districts yeah all those uh, questions seem, did they want yeah. single transferable districts multi-member district all that yeah maybe they did maybe they didn't but like that is not what you know i'd say if you ask people 90 percent of them voted for the charter reform commission for the terribleness that was the commission system, not because they're like, oh, yeah, single transferable There's voting. Like, they're running away something. from something. They're not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but we'll see. I mean, it is. It is really untested here. I think the only places that do it elsewhere, they already have existing parties. So you're not ranking a bunch of people. You're like, I always vote it's green and base. labor and yeah. whatever. And so like whether it's, you know, parliament or for the city i'm always going to just rank in that way and it's mm -hmm. pretty straightforward so i mean we'll see how it goes yeah um it'll be interesting i mean i think we should be open to changing things if it's not working mm -hmm. um but you know i mean you you work with what you have currently yeah yeah um but i do think that would be my first thing is i would i would change it so that for now we now we have to redistrict because we're not citywide the both the redistricting and then the city is for all future ones. If it's a citizen one, you cannot run for office. Yeah. Um, after you've been involved as a citizen, because you're I, not a citizen at that point. I've definitely yeah heard that from a lot of people that it's yeah complaining about that and people that I don't even actually know if anyone's currently running who's on the, I guess you probably know better than me. But there's, I know Robin dropped out. Robin dropped out. There's of another person that is running. I think there's one or two people that are okay. running. They're not in District 3, so I'm not paying too yeah. close of attention to yeah. their races. But <laughs> I, I agree that that should not be, I don't know, it just seems like an unfair advantage. And um... I, I think it's not even so much an unfair advantage as it, it corrupts the system because you are not asking, whether consciously or subconsciously, you're not asking what's best for the city. You're yeah. like, oh, you know, well, maybe maybe this would help me. It's more of a self, yeah, yeah oriented thing. Um, yeah, I, I like all this stuff. Um, I was gonna ask you quickly too about. I saw this right before you got here, but did you you wrote a book as well? Did you yeah, I, well, I I wrote two books. I wrote a policy book. Okay. Um, after legalization, understand the future marijuana policy. That was because I previously worked. Um, on a campaign, the Just Say Now campaign, and we we were pretty effective. We forced 
we humiliated Reddit and Facebook into changing their uh, advertising policy. They used to not allow, uh, mer you know, weed ads or something. We yeah. well, no, they used to not allow campaigns that dealt with drug reform. Oh, really? To advertise because they're like, no, that's drug related, and they're like, well, I see. Okay, they're like, it's illegal, but they're like, but they're like, no, we're trying to make it not so illegal. We're trying to change it. Like, they, <laughs> advocating to change the law is not illegal. Like, right. um, so we kind of humiliated them to doing that, and we. I mean, we got together a big coalition of people on like the left and right to just be like, hey, this is an issue. People care about it. I mean, it's tough to think about now, but back when I did it, you know, it was like three members of Congress that were willing yeah. to support it. I mean, it's a little different. There's, now. there's a massive gap. But um, I so I wrote that book just about like how. But, you know, this is before it was legal anywhere, how I thought it, it was. It was like a pat. Yeah. How it was going to play out, basically. Or... And I think I've. I did a pretty good job of predicting how it was rolling out. And then I, I wrote a science fiction book. But that's oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to check those out. Yeah. Um, okay. I was going to ask you quick, too, before I get into these last questions. Um, do you have a mayoral pick right now? I currently don't have a mayoral pick. I mean, the, the great thing about running is I'm getting a chance to meet a bunch of the mayoral candidates. And so I would have time to sort of study them in depth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at this point, yeah, I mean, it is pretty early in the election cycle. I'm going to wait and see how everything develops, how everybody's campaign goes. Um, and also, again, because this system is very new, mm -hmm. I think it's probably beneficial for what I want my role in the city council to do is to not be endorsing any candidate for mayor because I want to be the person who, regardless of the issue, can work on the nuts and bolts of how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I want to kind of leave that space open. You're ready to work with anybody. Yeah. yeah. You know, I want to, <laughs> I want to be able to work with anybody and I want to, because I have a specific set of skills I want to bring to it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay. Yeah. You kind of mentioned earlier, but is there anything before, I guess I didn't, before I get into your Northwest story, is there anything else policy wise you want to talk about? Um, you know, I think, I just want to go back to like my top priorities are implementation, implementation, implementation. Yeah. I think you are the first person to actually use that word, I think, too, <laughs> of the I'm, candidates I've talked to. I mean, I think it is just really important that like, for example, we have this inclusionary zoning rule thing. So like you have to have a certain number of affordable units. Yeah. Or if you don't, you give money to the city to build affordable units. Yeah, I know about that. Yeah. Uh, we haven't we got like eight million dollars. We haven't spent any of it mm. like so. It does not matter if you have an idea like that, if it's not being implemented. And like that is like issue after issue we see in Portland. Mm. Is that like it's a chronic, chronic it is it is a chronic issue that we do not lack for ideas. We lack for that accountability and that figuring out how to make things work. Mm. Um and so I think that really needs to be applied just across the spectrum. And I think talking about the plans and i think it's premature for almost anyone to be talking about big plans like i've got big plans too i would love to cap like the 405 you know cap that and either put parks or housing mm -hmm. over that like they have in boston i mean boston they dug the highway under we already have it under we just have to it would be put, interesting yeah put something over the top yeah. but i i don't think we can get to a place where we can either pull off anything big or convince the voters to support really anything new and big until we show them that we can be implementing the things that we already have yeah be functional and yeah because like i come at this from the healthcare space we got a for medicaid we got what's known as a 1115 waiver so we're gonna get a bunch of money to spend on housing like half a billion for the state to spend on transitional housing for people who for whatever reason are like on the risk of becoming homelessness uh, so it's like a temporary help we got a bunch of money during the COVID. We did not spend it to help people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very fearful that once again, we got another bite of the apple to help a bunch of people and we're, we're going to mess it up. Um, I was curious, yeah, do you see um, the PCEF money also in that category of like, hey, we got all this money and we got all this now money. we're just like, oh. <laughs> we, yeah, what are we going to do with it? Okay. I mean, yeah, I think, again, we've allowed that because we have this chronic thing in Portland of it's become its own little fiefdom of all that piece of people. Mm. They're like, well, how, how are we going to distribute this money? Like, you know, what are your grants going to be? What is like, no, you gotta, you write out 
the rules. Like, this is what you have to do. This mm -hmm. is what qualifies. This is what doesn't. So that you are not playing the role right. of the, of like the party <laughs> boss or whatever. The money distributor. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be letting people build like mini Tammy Halls of like, oh, you know, I like you or whatever. No, because I mean, that's how we've wound up in a situation where the law grant monies have gone to terrible things that, what is it, the art thing recently? Uh, art a few, or... Yeah, they like they just gave money to somebody. Okay. And an excuse. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the city hall thing. No, this it... was actually before the city hall. There oh, okay. There's <laughs> an arts tax money thing. I think where like I know about the arts tax. Yeah. And all the grants were like usually like a thousand, two thousand, and then inexplicably like a friend of someone on the committee got like got a bunch of got grants. like eighty thousand yeah. for. Well, yeah, the one I was. I don't know how true this is. I've heard from people on the show that that a lot of that money, because I in my head, and I think I voted for it years ago, um, the art tax, but but in my head, I'm always like that goes right to schools. <laughs> but it took me a while in talking to people here on the show that like a lot of it, some of it does, but it's yeah. not a lot. A lot yeah. of it's grants and stuff that. I mean, the arts tax is the thing that kills me because it. So I don't know how long it takes you. It takes me about I don't know, like half an hour. To fill out that art sex thing and mm -hmm. i usually get about three pieces of mail about it so each piece of mail costs the city about a buck yeah 25. the way they implemented it was yeah. yeah so and then it takes me if it takes me half an hour you know that's whatever you value your time at like even minimum wage like yeah, ten dollars payable hour yeah like so like hour or whatever yeah. 10 15 dollars and then three dollars and then we're spending more money telling people to pay 35 dollars <laughs> than like we're getting in 35 dollars like yeah the fact that we can't be like, hey, can we get this same money in another way where we're not spending yeah. it's funny. everyone's time and money just to get this? It's funny you bring that because I've mentioned before, like whenever I pay my taxes every year on whatever, TurboTax or whatever, yeah. they have a checkbox and you do that for the arch tax and then it just sends you to the, yeah. you still have to do it the old snail mail way. And I'm just like, if they had that there where you could just allocate it. Yeah, I mean, if you could, or you could just slap it on to like, I don't know, my water bill or something. Like, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's so many other ways the city gets money. It's crazy that we allow something so inefficient. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's that's what we need to change. Is we need to just look at like, hey, how do we make these things work? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. Is there anything you kind of mentioned a little bit about your story, but tell me yeah, how you got here, or did you grow up here? Or whatever? Um, no, I well, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I moved here about 10 years ago. I, I found out that my family, my great, great grandfather fought in the civil war with the union with custard and then left custard and moved to Oregon. He actually moved to about a mile from where we are currently. Really? So like, I, yeah, I found out he settled in Portland and I was able to find a old, it's not a phone book, but it was like a address <laughs> book. And I found it was like Mount Scott, like wow. this area. So I found out he like basically settled like a mile from where my house is currently. So that's kind of wild. Yeah. So I got like, a, I got family here in the area. Um, and you know, I moved here about a decade ago. Um, and now I've got my two little boys you know, I've got a wife, I got a three year old and I got a six year old who's uh, in the Spanish immersion program at Atkinson's. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so you moved. Uh. This be like twenty fourteen or something like that. You... Yeah. Okay. I was curious. Cool. Um. Okay. Let me get in these goofy questions here. Um. Let's say you're parking somewhere like you did earlier. Um. Do you normally pull in or do you back in? I usually pull in. Okay. Yeah. Like a normal. Yeah. Most people do that. I think. <laughs> um. Do you like crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Or maybe you don't like peanut butter. Uh. I like smooth peanut butter because that's what my kids like, and yeah. they have a lot of peanut butter. So you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go with <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, they go with whatever their kids want. Um, and What's do you, happening? You like the stir, or do I guess do they like the stir? No stir. The oil? no stir. Okay. No, yeah. They. I mean, my son. You know, he's got to the age of six year old where he likes to make his own sandwiches, but like, okay, that would be that would be too much for him to. It's, yeah. To be stirring it, you know, it not not quite at that. Yeah. I get it. Um. Which piece of fruit do you think you could throw the farthest if you just threw it across the football field? I would probably say a coconut. Coconut? Oh, I like that. I've never heard that one. I mean, that, that's like a good, it's kind of like it's baseball like a hollow, size. hollow a bowling ball or something. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's pretty <laughs> heavy. It's pretty substantial. I yeah. feel like most other fruit would kind of not be all that aerodynamic. I could be on that board, on board with that, like a slightly bigger than your palm-sized coconut. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Um, uh, 
let's say you're getting ice cream at salt and strata you go waffle cone regular cone cup i i usually go sugar cone i'm my house is actually <laughs> okay that's regular is yeah so, regular okay cone. my house is one block from salt and strata is that <laughs> so right we go, we go there a lot. <laughs> Do you get that like the inside, like you can skip the lines because you're right now, you can like no, get no. the good time to go in there or something? Oh, no, I know. I mean, I like kind of just look out. I was like, oh, yeah, no, that, that line's too long. We're not getting ice cream right now. Get the direct sight of the line meter. Yeah. Um, and what flavor are you putting in there? Here we go. You know, I, I really like to go with whatever their seasonal flavors are. I almost never get their like their standard right. ones. Regular ones, yeah. I mean, I, I love the berry ones right now. Those are good. I think summer thing. Yeah. yeah the berry slab pie or wild, mm. wild berry slab pie. That was good. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite type of French fry? You like regular cut, crinkle cut? Wild. I like a regular cut French fry. Okay. Just a classic. Yeah. Um, do you keep your butter, <laughs> do you keep your butter in the fridge or out? I don't know. Why. No, we keep it out. Okay. Yeah. Nice and spreadable. Yeah. Um, do you like string cheese? String cheese is okay. My kids like it. Do you, do you peel it or? I peel the string cheese. You peel it, okay. I'm 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 in such a minority. The more that I ask that question, I'm just like I don't. Oh, you do. <laughs> I just solid, eat it. Yeah. Solid bite into it. it. I mean, it's kind of like fun to play with it. It's, you gotta you gotta make the strings. Yeah, you can take your time with it and stuff. Um, if you had a, if you were forced to run a gigantic brand, is there a brand you'd want to run? Oh, like a like a company or whatever. Yeah, Nike um, or something. Or... I mean, I love Bob's Red Mill. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Gigantic. Shout I mean, out to Bob. He died yeah a couple months ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's great brand, great yeah. products. I mean national brand. I yeah, I believe yeah. That'd be that's a cool choice. Um, uh, did you have a good meal somewhere recently, or like a business you want to shout out? Oh yeah, you know I uh, I went to Turning Peel not too long ago on a vision. Turn... Turning Peel. Turning Peel. Okay. It's a it's pizza. It's really good. That sounds like an interesting name for a pizza. I love pizza. Yeah, it's like uh it's like forty seventh in division. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, so that's really nice. That's so pretty I was thinking that's pretty close to uh I used to go to Atlas on division. Oh yeah. That's was... like right up the road, it seems like yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um all right. I always tell people I'm gonna give you a chance. Where if you, people like what you're saying, where's the best place to go? Your website? To yeah. Donate and all that stuff. Yeah, go uh walkerforportland.com. That's the website. Um on all the social medias, um John Walker PDX to your Twitters, your blue skies, your Instagram. Okay, cool. And yeah, now everyone who comes on here, I'll give you a donation because I love the match program. I think it's great. Excellent. Thank and you. So yeah, I'll give you a donation to help you get to the match, hopefully. Um and yeah, and if you like what John's saying, give him a donation. You can do I say this a lot, but you can donate from any district. You don't have to be in District Three. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do that if you like. Yeah, the the match program is is huge, and I think uh, it's very interesting because we went from a city council where you needed like two hundred and you know forty thousand people to win, um, to now you need like twenty thousand votes yeah. to like win in your district, and so it's it's great that you don't have to raise a lot of money. And I don't think you'll have to spend a huge amount of money to reach that number of people. But like, and that's a great thing about the match program. If you can raise 200 from just or, or from 200 people in Portland, I think you they've set it up that the amount of money you get is enough that I think you should be able to reach your constituents mm -hmm. um, without having to, you know, ask big outside groups to be spending a huge amount on your behalf because. Yeah, you don't need to at yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up here? Uh no, you know, just uh you know, vote for me. I'm I'm boring. <laughs> if you want things to be more boring when it comes to how your government's working and consider me for your second, third, or fourth choice if I'm not your first choice. If you if you uh like to f forget about government in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, thanks so much for coming today, John. Ah, oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah.